Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hello. My... Chris, thanks for sending the link. We're migrating oh, sure. over to Microsoft 365. Oh, we did that last year, the whole process. So <laughs> I was like, I have no idea. So I'm doing my email. Well, I'm actually doing 65 on the browser right now. Mm -hmm. So it's good because I can sort of do it, but I, I, it's just, you know, anyway, it'd be better when it's set up into the app. <laughs> and I can just click and away you go. So I am just fighting with everything here today. <laughs> Hi, Jean. Nice Chris. to meet you. I'm Chris Morgan. Nice to, hi there. How are you? I did find the link. It was actually already in my my calendar. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, I, I, I just it was just a crazy day today, and I was like, I don't know if I got the link, so let's just ask again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always try to send it a reminder the day of, just in case, too, because it's always good to have it fresh in your inbox. Uh, well, because, otherwise you have to go. <laughs> now, do I? Do I share my screen with with the slideshow, or do you do that? No, uh, you share your screen with the slideshow, and I spotlight okay. it for everybody. I'm going to make um, uh -huh. everyone co-hosts. But I'll do that um, after we you, you do your introductions, right? Yes. Yep. I'm just going to uh, men mention the thing about the attendance today and people changing their names. Okay. It's been a whole trial and error process we've been going through trying to figure out. Oh, demos. I know. I've, I've, I have only done a couple of webinars myself through the community college, you know? Yeah. Um, it's tough. It's tough. Uh, I mean, I taught for 20 years at the culinary, so I, in person. <laughs> so. Oh, okay. I, used to, I, I worked there for a, a tiny bit with um, Eileen DeVries in the library. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was there from 94 to 2014. Oh, I was there uh, 2011 to 2012, so in that time period. Yeah, I, I retired in 2014, didn't want to be fully retired. You'll probably hear me say that again. But... <laughs> well, unfortunately, they didn't send us a bio for you because I'm usually the one to introduce. My name is Sylvia Rivera. Hi there. Hi there. Okay. And I usually do the introductions for the speaker because okay. this is a co-sponsorship with the city of Newburgh and uh -huh. with the Small Business Administration. And Miriam forgot to send it to me. Okie dokie. Well, I, I, I've, I've given my- I'll let you I've do given your own my intro. <laughs> I'll introduce you and then you could tell them all about you okay. and how amazing you are. <laughs> okay. Oh, I have it. I can send it over to you right now. Sure. I'd appreciate it's a, it. Yeah. Um, it was in our Google Doc, but I'll, I'll send it to you right now. Excellent, thank you. Hi, Jean. I'm Ellen Hi. with the city of Newburgh. It's Hi, really nice to meet you. you. Nice to meet you too. How many people yeah. usually show up for these things? It can vary. Um, typically, I think we had about um, 40 last time. Wow, okay. And they're all blanked out, I assume, or do they keep their faces up? <laughs> it's up for the, up to them. I remind people in the beginning that it's recorded. Okay. Um, Sylvia, I just sent it to you, so you should have it now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Absolutely. That was one of the reasons I didn't really like the webinars is that most people blank it out and it's just like, I don't know. Anyway. I'm it, can make it, it can make it awkward when you're teaching. No, you don't see, there's I'm, no feedback you get from people. But I would say it's about maybe a fourth or a third leave their cameras on when, when, during mm -hmm. the meetings. Okay. It's and, we, and I usually turn mine off just to, so it's not so distracting. Yeah. <laughs> or it's like, I know. Yeah. I, we, we did a we did a, a a statewide meeting yesterday with our new state director, and most people had their screen off. But oh, okay. Everybody, you know, not everybody. Some people actually have like a standard photo that they leave up. Of yeah. Themselves. Oh, okay. Mine just says J, so I just left my self up. <laughs> oh, um, Ellen and Sylvia, um, I do have to um, leave after the first twenty minutes again. I'm sorry. Okay. It's a, we're pretty short staffed right now. So I've got to be back on the reference desk. Oh, okay. That's <laughs> yeah. all right. I'm um, oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. But I'll be here for the getting everything started and the introductions and everything. And your co host, oh. you can admit people as they, as they come in. We appreciate that. You set everything up for us, Chris. It's really wonderful. As always. <laughs> He's amazing. Oh, thank you. I, I love working with oh. you all too. <laughs> oh, come miss you. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to message everyone in the waiting room right now, just so we're going to get started in a few moments. 
The Brooklyn girl. Oh, me? Oh, yeah. I'm a Brooklyn girl. <laughs> That's wonderful. I am definitely from Brooklyn. Jesus. Born and raised. I was born actually in Coney Island Hospital. Get out. Wow. I got friends from Coney Island Hospital. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I hate to tell you how long ago, but okay, fine. Just I the said, other day. Yeah, just the other day. 72 years ago, actually. <laughs> Get out. Go ahead, girl. Yeah. You grew up in the best of times. <laughs> I moved to Woodstock in 73. I see. You fell into the restaurant business. Oh, yes. I like that. <laughs> I fell into it. <laughs> I wasn't planning on doing that at all, but it, 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 I needed a job when I moved to Woodstock. And I found one. <laughs> So now you've came back to us as a part-time counselor. Mm -hmm. oh, nice. From the CIA, covering every Institute of America. And they'd be like, what? <laughs> I told CIA person, uh-oh. Uh <laughs> what, what's it the Central Intelligence Agency? I was just going to say non-Hudson Valley people don't get that one. You say CIA. <laughs> yeah. If you're from around here, you think food. Everyone else thinks the government. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, I taught business planning at the at the the Culinary Institute, not the Central Intelligence Agency. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good one. Um, uh, do people mind if I start admitting people from the waiting room? Please do. Go go oh, go for it. Okay, I'm not going to save that. Don't save. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We'll be getting started in a few moments. Uh, just a quick housekeeping note. We're doing something a little different with, different with attendance now. Um, if people could um, change their name in the Zoom chat to the name they registered with, that would be really, really helpful. And I'm just going to paste instructions on how to do that in case anyone needs. Um, but that's just so we can take attendance for the certificate of completion for those who want to attend all six uh, sessions. I'm just going to put that link in right now. And thank you, thank you, thank you for being early and on time. It makes a big difference with <laughs> getting started and everything. A big difference. I was so grateful. I'm like, I actually sent you an email and then all of a sudden it, it kicked in after the fact. I tried the link and it didn't work. And then I tried it again after I sent the email and it worked fine. I'm like, okay. Sorry. Yes. And apologies again for everyone who got caught up in the technical difficulties uh, last meeting. That, that won't happen again. <laughs> Good. Excellent day. Yeah. So, Jadi, please put your full name in the registration. What did, you, did you want them to say they put their name and their full name in the chat or in the email or? Oh, no. Um, if you look in the um, the participant column, um, if people could change their name there to their full name, that would be really helpful. Excellent. That helps when we do our uh, attendance report after the meeting. But uh, instructions are right in the chat for how to do that. Well, I'm going to get us started. Um, my name is Chris Morgan. I am the adult programming librarian and outreach librarian at the Newburgh Free Library. And we welcome you to uh, the third class in our spring series of Small Business Bootcamp. Um, we're so happy to have um, with us tonight, uh, guest instructor, Jean Morris. And um, just a reminder for everyone that these are recorded um, in case you can't stay for the full class. Um, and they'll be sent out in the recap for all the registrants tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to pass things over to Ellen Fillo with the City of Newburgh. Ellen. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for attending uh, another one of these wonderful uh, small business boot camp workshops. And uh, we thank our, our co-sponsorship partner, the Small Business Administration, Newburgh Free Library for wonderful Chris for setting everything up for us. 
and the uh, Small Business Development Center uh, for uh, providing us with all these great uh, presenters. And um, so I'm gonna pass this along to Miss Sylvia or Miss Lily uh, from the Small Business Administration. Thank you, Ellen, as usual. You always do a great presentation. Thank you, thank you everybody. My name is Sylvia Rivera, also known as Lily. I work with the Small Business Administration as an economic development specialist and we bring all these wonderful programs to you at no extra cost. That's right, these are your tax dollars at work. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce you to the lovely Jean Morris who grew up in Brooklyn, surrounded by entrepreneurs. Her dad owned his own casting business, which helped inspire her later in life. She moved to Woodstock, a good old hangout, in 1973 and fell into the restaurant business. She worked her way out from breakfast cook to chef owner of a restaurant and had two locations at one point, one in Kingston and one in Woodstock. Jean left the industry in 1985 and found her true calling, helping entrepreneurs start their own businesses. She worked at the Mid Hudson Small Business Development Center from 1985 until 1994, emerging from counselor to center director. What? She was recruited to teach business planning and entrepreneurship, as well as other business related classes at the Culinary Institute of America, where she taught for 20 years. She retired from the CIA, haha, <laughs> not that CIA, but and came back to the SBDC as a part-time counselor in 2014, sharing her knowledge and helping everybody get started and becoming successful in business. And so I move on to say thank you, Jean, for joining us. And please take it over. Well, welcome everybody to, uh, so you have an appetite for food business. Like uh, Sylvia said, I fell into the restaurant business back when I moved to Woodstock. It wasn't what I was expecting to do. I fell in love, um, surprisingly, and uh, stayed in the industry for quite a long time. And then I did spend you know, a good 20 years teaching the subject of entrepreneurship and business planning to uh, the wonderful students at the culinary and back to SBDC because I really like uh, helping people and hopefully we'll be helping any of you that might have an interest in the food business. So I'm going to take it over and share my screen and uh, let's see, and my slideshow. Let's see if I can get the slideshow up. Hold on a minute. Why is it not up? Slideshow, okay, here we go. From the beginning, come on, slideshow. Come on. So, do you have an appetite for a food business? I'm going to take you through a number of different steps that uh, are necessary if you have an interest in the food business. It's surprising to me that even given what's gone on in the last two years that I am still very busy with people in the food business. Um, so it, it has been an interesting ride for food businesses certainly over the last two years, um, as you probably all are very much aware of. So the agenda is why food service? Why do you wanna do this? Is it because you have a, a great recipe that you like uh, and wanna share? Is it because you have a love for food and wanna share your love for food and, and, and people? Um, it, there's a whole sorts of reasons why people are going into the food service business currently. I will talk about a, a of some of the different segments of the industry. Restaurants, obviously, because that is my background. I also talk about uh, specialty food because a lot of, I do get a, quite a number of people who are looking to start a food business where they are producing the food as I like to call them, food manufacturers, um, food trucks. There's all sorts of components that make up the uh, food industry. I'll talk a little bit about some of the COVID resources that I had to, that I researched for my clients and for you folks, uh, some of them are, you know, through uh, the Restaurant Association and the like. Uh, I'll do a little bit about business basics for foodies primarily, though I will uh, go back over some of the information that you might have already heard in, 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 uh, if you were in the other event um, webinar with Sam Candell um, or Miriam Bouchard. Um, and then talk a little bit about the licensing requirements that are specific to the food industry. 
and then leave some time for Q&A. And I, I really like q and And then what will happen is because generally when I've done these classes before in the past in person, I bring a whole stack of information with some of the licensing requirements with me. Um, I have them. I can certainly send them out to you at the end if you like, uh, or, or in the next few days, all you have to do is send me an email. My email is, is uh, morrisj at sunyulster.edu, and it's at the end of the presentation. I also say that as well, because email has been the best way for me to be in touch with people. And especially if, if many of you are down here in Orange County rather than Ulster County, currently I'm still primarily working from home. Uh, so that's why I give you out my email address. Come on. Uh, why are we not going forward? Oh, come on. There we go. So why food service? Again, as I said, you know, I'm going to be talking about the, some of the different segments that are, you know, apparent in the food industry. I start with specialty food um, because I have, as I said, get it, I have been getting quite a number of people who want to produce a food product. And I think of that as mostly in the specialty food industry. So I start with that. And also specialty food has seemed to have um, good legs during COVID. Uh, there's been a tremendous growth in the industry um, in, as you can see from my quote, the, and much of this information comes from the specialty food association. Uh, so it, it's not stuff that I made up. And specialty food represents about 8.9% of overall food sales and has definitely grown a lot over the last two years because of COVID. Uh, industry sales are in the billions of dollars. Um, and then it, bricks and mortar stores in, in the specialty food industry also represent a fairly large portion of that industry. And it's an online sales are also very big. I mean, a lot of folks because of COVID have stayed home and they've ordered and those of us that do the shopping, you know, and go shopping in, in, in bricks and mortar, both regular grocery stores as well as specialty grocery stores see that the shelves sometimes are empty. And, you know, there's all sorts of issues behind that, but the, they certainly have been moving uh, products. So what is selling now according to the industry and according to the specialty food folks? Um, cheese and plant-based cheeses. Uh, cheese seems to be a big item, uh, maybe because it's easy to eat. I don't know, but certainly it's a big item. Uh, certainly meat, poultry, seafood, frozen and refrigerated because more people were eating from home than they were out in restaurants, certainly during COVID. There's been a, tr uh, a large increase in the number of, of products that are out there and what are selling. Snacks, big, I mean, a lot of folks are into snacks. They're sitting at home, they were sitting at home eating and you know, not necessarily dressed for like they were for work. And so chips, pretzels, and all snacks are very big as well. Coffee and cocoa, uh, chocolate and other confections have been very big in selling. Um, certainly frozen desserts have come out big time and certainly frozen entrees. I know as a former chef owner of a restaurant, you know, I, I don't tend to use much in the way of frozen food just because I made from scratch, but I could understand why some people might like to use the frozen foods that are currently in the marketplace and even in the specialty food marketplace because then they get tired of their own cooking. I know I've gotten tired of my own cooking. I don't know about anybody else out there, but I certainly have gotten tired of my own cooking and because I don't go out to eat very much um, and haven't for the last two years. So people are looking for other items that make to interest them in, in Jean, I think you muted yourself. Yeah. Oh, I did that. I, did, I didn't touch anything. <laughs> anyway, water is big and certainly bread and baked goods are very big. And when I talk a little bit about licensing and I talk a little bit about the, the home processor license, you will see that that's one of the items that has been uh, growing a lot is bread and baked goods. Okay, so let's go. 
So can I move this? It's like in the way. Oh, well, the impact on the COVID's impact on food industry. It was the largest year to year growth. We've seen a tremendous increase in home consumption. And maybe that's going to change as we move forward and COVID uh, might disappear or it, we don't know what's gonna be happening obviously. And certainly there's been an increase in the online sales as I said already. And the, the things that have been flying off the shelves are baked, baking mixes, uh, ingredients, uh, shelf stable pasta, pizza sauces, soup, and any kind of shelf stable entrees and mixes have all been flying off the shelves in, in the stores. So those are th some things to consider if you have an interest in being a, produ a food producer. And so thinking about who might actually be the consumer for specialty food, it might have been that we were assuming that it was primarily baby boomers, but according to the industry information that I read, a lot of the core consumer for specialty food especially are younger millennials, uh, that's 26 to 34. Uh, I guess they have found that they are now, again, not going out to eat as much as they may have at one point. I happen to have a son who falls into that category. He's 32 now. Um, and actually he's working at Whole Foods. So I guess that kind of qualifies as specialty food as well as grocery. Um, and he's always looking for new items to cook and make and uh, prepare at home. Um, luckily for him, he gets a nice discount from Whole Foods while working there. Um, and so he can do that. Um, and then the next co major consumer for specialty food is the Gen Z as they move a little closer to adulthood and are learning how to cook and wanting to cook and learning all about food and the, the different items that might be out there. And then Gen X comes next. And lastly, and I guess maybe it's only because us baby boomers, I happen to be one, uh, are aging out. And maybe we just don't have the same interest in specialty food as some of the younger folks. We just wanna eat what we're used to eating and not doing a lot of exploration. I don't know if that's true, but they, they are uh, not a very large consumer of specialty food. Um, so that's the, the uh, specialty food stats. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the restaurant industry where I worked in for 12 years. Um, sales stayed up. They obviously went down during COVID because uh, people either were not going out to eat and or were limiting their dining out and restaurants went from eating in to taking out, uh, outdoor seating, um, all sorts of changes had to happen in, inside the restaurant industry because of COVID. Um, there's a, a million plus locations nationwide. Um, they have been a very large employer of uh, Americans. 15.6 million people as of 2020 worked in restaurants. Um, uh, employment did go down because of COVID, as you can well imagine. Um, and according to the Re National Restaurant Association, 10% of the US workforce has actually worked in restaurants, which is a fairly large number, uh, all things considered. Um, and one of the good reasons why there has been some effort on the federal side to help restaurateurs is because they do happen to have a fairly large group of people that actually have worked in restaurants. And me, like many other restaurant owners, started our career in the restaurant industry at an entry level position. As I said, I fell into the restaurant industry. My uh, college degree happens to be in history. I always thought that I was gonna be a history teacher and that didn't happen. Um, and when I moved to Woodstock, I needed a job. Uh, I, I went to work, a friend of mine was working at a local restaurant in Woodstock called Joshua's which is just currently for sale or may have already sold, I don't know. The, the daughter took it over and um, she's looking to get out of the business. And um, the, the owner of the restaurant called me into the kitchen. I had a friend that was a waitress and he said, uh, throw two eggs on the grill. I threw two eggs on the grill. 
said, flip them over. I flipped them over. They didn't break. He said, you're hired. Uh, so when I was teaching at the culinary and I would tell that story, my students would laugh uh, because it's kind of funny. I, I was never classically trained, but it was an entry level position. I stayed with the gentleman for six months, found another job up the road at a, a higher end restaurant uh, and moved my way from a breakfast cook to chef and then eventually became a chef owner with a business partner. Most restaurants are fairly small, as you can well imagine. Um, we certainly were small in our restaurant that we owned, that I owned um, with my business partner, both in Woodstock and in Kingston. We certainly had less than 50 employees. Uh, I was the uh, co-chef with my business partner. We had one or two or three other cooks in the restaurant, um, had dishwashers and wait staff uh, and bartenders. Um, less than 10 people at, at any given time were working in our restaurant. And it was a 50 seat restaurant, which is fairly typical. And most restaurants are single unit operations. We ended up at one point having two places at the same time, Woodstock and Kingston. We had been asked to go to a seasonal place at the Woodstock Tennis Club. Uh, we were there and um, while we had the place in, in, in Kingston as well. But most places are single operators. Oops, go back, how do you go back? Oh. So COVID impact. Now we're still feeling the COVID impact, I believe in, on, the, on the restaurant side, much more so than on the specialty food side. As you can see by the graph that I, I, I got from the Restaurant Association, sales really dipped in 2020, as you can well imagine. Uh, they had been considerably higher. They were going back up. Uh, and then with the, the, the variant, they went back down and I believe that they're going back up again. Uh, but we did see a tremendous dip. Uh, many restaurants did close, uh, some never to reopen. And uh, obviously many have opened and as a small business development center counselor, I see lots of foodies and both on the specialty food side, on the restaurant side. And I, we see people wanting to start restaurants all the time, uh, even given the set of circumstances that we have been faced in the industry. Uh, and I'm happy to say that, you know, I've helped any number of people get started, uh, either using their own money and or trying to and borrowing money as well. And it, it's still, it's still a vibrant industry for sure. Employment trends, the same trends that happened on the sales side, there was a tremendous dip in the number of, of employees, as you can well see that there was a, uh, you know, a pretty big downslide, but then the places were closed and they were only doing takeout. They, they laid off people, um, but the employment has trended upwards again, just like the sales have trended upwards. And one can only hope in this industry that that continues. And it looks like it will be. Uh, I know that living in the Ulster County area, you know, and I'm, I'm assuming the same thing's happening here in, in Orange and all, elsewhere, wherever anybody might be coming from, is that they would, did a lot of outdoor dining. And I know the city of Kingston has made an effort to help restaurants in Kingston by allowing outdoor dining and they're going to continue to do that, uh, the outdoor dining on streets, taking over some of the parking spaces so that play, people who don't feel very comfortable in going inside can still eat outside. It's become a, a much bigger uh, idea for restaurants for sure. So that will mean that they will be bringing back more employees or one hopes they will be bringing out back more employees. The National Restaurant Association, which is a nationwide association of restaurateurs, is a, still a very vibrant association, trade association. Um, and I do talk a little bit about trade shows because I believe that they're a really good place for people to get to learn about the industry. And the National Restaurant Association has a trade association uh, annual meeting. And they, they worked very hard on trying to get the Congress to put together, um, it was called a restaurant revitalization grant and uh, lots of folks applied for it. Some of my clients actually received the grant uh, to help them through the process of, you know, working through the COVID-19 problems that the restaurants had. 
it has sunset as of now, and they are working hard at, at, uh, with the um, Congress to try to bring it back because people still need some money. Um, and they do a lot of work on their website and through their membership uh, with helping people try to figure out how to recover uh, and reopen if they were closed. Um, and then state by state, there's all, they, they also had a reopening blueprint for the restaurant revival. FDA is another resource that is in, uh, helping people with through the COVID uh, best practices for the retail food stores. Um, and when you get, I believe that the, you know, the library and the sponsors of this uh, evening's event send out a PDF file. I'm, I don't know if in the PDF file there's links, those lines mean that there's a link to those, to the website where that came from. And if you're interested in taking a look at it, you can certainly uh, click the link and, and see the kind of information that they do have. And they do have a lot of stuff. FDA is, a, uh, is big on helping people with getting through what was going on with COVID and are staying with it. And they have a checklist uh, at, uh, to help people uh, during the pandemic. And then some other COVID resources. Uh, there's an organ, there's a, a, a program called Surf Save, which they, I believe that uh, the CIA also provides the training for Surf Save. That's a certification process um, that you know, some states actually require at least one individual in a restaurant uh, to have be Surf Save certified. That's tough to say, but they uh, they they do ask. They do provide that information, and they also have done work on providing information, uh, training on how to be safe during this whole period with the pandemic. The New York State Department of Health also does something very similar in terms of its uh, providing some resources and guidance for different kinds of businesses, not only food businesses, but other businesses that might need to know something about how to maintain their, the health of their workers and the health of the, the facility that they're in. Um, the International Food and Food Service Show had a COVID-19 resource page IDDBA, which is the International Bakery Association, also had a resource page that if you're interested in baking and specifically in baking, they also had a resource page. Since I'm talking about specialty food and food productions and uh, food producers and food manufacturers, I have looked into the Food Processor Association. They too have a COVID page, as does the specialty food uh, magazine. They, uh, Specialty Food Association now does a magazine and in the past I could get a lot of information for nothing from them and I have found that in the last year or so they kind of wanted me to pay for some of their information as well to join as a member. All these trade associations are member driven, uh, you know, membership driven and there is a charge for some of the documentation that they give and then there's some stuff that's out there that's free. I always look for free because the small business development services are free. And so I look for free as well, because I know that my clients are generally needing to preserve their capital as much as possible for their business. So what's hot on the culinary side? Uh, Eco-friendly packaging. I mean, I talk to people all the time. I have a client that was looking to, uh, she had a small restaurant with her husband and she was looking to package her granola and but she didn't want to package it in packaging that wasn't eco friendly so I did some research for her and I found some packaging companies that offered eco friendly packaging. Um, it was it's a little bit more expensive than regular packaging but she that's how she wanted to produce her food and that's how she wanted to present it that they were eco friendly so there is quite a bit of eco friendly packaging out there. Um, as you know, you know, we've gone so much to plastic um, and people are unhappy with that. So they're, they're looking for some alternative through eco-friendly packaging. From scratch, obviously, you know, going back to the specialty food side, you know, looking to make things on our own from scratch is always a good thing and certainly uh, important. 
Same thing happens on the culinary side, making things from scratch rather than buying pre-made uh, you know, food. The restaurateurs are looking to continue to make their own scratch-made food. Plant-based proteins, we've all seen that. You know, you go to the market now and you see meat that's not meat and, and uh, other items are very big and, and hot, if you would, in, in, in on the culinary side as well. Uh, healthy bowls are also very big. You know, healthy bowls might be either a noodle bowl or a rice bowl uh, because people are more interested and have become far more interested in what they're putting into their body and what's healthy for them to eat. So healthy bowls are also uh, important. Uh, creativity with catering, you know, how do they actually do catering? I've had a number of clients in my portfolio, my client portfolio that are looking you know, that are caterers and what do they do to make their products look good and taste good and be creative because that's what their client base. And even given COVID, some of my clients that are were caterers were still fairly busy with doing uh, catering jobs. Um, uh, one, one, one and the other thing one of my clients did at the beginning of COVID is he got involved in some of the resiliency uh, projects that were uh, in, happening in in our area where the there was a grant that would help pay for his food to be produced that, and it was all very special food because he was a great chef uh, and he would produce food for folks that needed food uh, because they were either not working um, and the resiliency programs were getting caterers to help the caterers not only be able to survive but also to provide food to people who needed who are in need of food. And then certainly delivery friendly menu items. Uh, I'm working with a, a fellow right now who wants to open up something in Orange County. And one of the things that he's looking at is all grab and go. And he, I asked him about delivery today because we're just working through the process of his business plan. And he's looking not only to do grab and go, uh, no dine in, all grab and go. And also things that are delivery friendly because he plans to deliver in a, in a relatively short radius from his location, only up to five miles, but, the, uh, but he needs to be able to figure out what items that he makes will be friendly for delivery. Uh, one of my colleagues in the office, his daughter is a, uh, has a cafe in Woodstock and she, has, she had moved originally to delivery uh, only as well as prepared meals and you know frozen prepared meals that somebody could pick up that. Um, and I think she's staying in that vein at the moment. Um, revamped classic cocktails, uh, you know, for those that have bars are, are also very big. Stress relievers, uh, ingredients that, that promote relaxation and relieve stress. I'm not sure that some people are putting any CBD in, you know, into their food items, um, but they're looking to increase the items that might reduce people's stress because people have been very stressed during COVID. Specialty burger blends, again, not, not all meat-based, and then some unique cuts of beef and pork are also very hot as well. Um, and then because we are moving in the direction in lots of different areas, not only just food, but obviously in other areas uh, to digital purchasing. Um, uh, th this is something that I found from, um, you know, some source, which I sourced on the, on the document. Uh, free shipping and delivery, more so now than any time in the past. Uh, uh, discounts on relevant products, uh, shop both online and on, in store, and a lot of folks are doing that. Certainly, as we all know, you know, online shopping has become very big. Uh, price matching with, uh, you know, different stores are looking at what their competition is doing. Um, same options in store as online. Um, I, I usually shop at a Hannaford, and they now do. Uh, delivery, which they never used to do, and they're offering online shopping as well. Hopefully we have shorter checkout lines because people don't wanna necessarily wait. And the, one of the reasons why they buy online and then pick up in-store or, or return in-store is that they don't want to 
um, you know, go to stores or hadn't wanted to go to stores. Ship to home, if not in stock, I do that all the time, same day delivery, online ordering uh, with pickup, and that's true for, you know, Bed Bath & Beyond and other stores as well. Um, and certainly restaurants have moved to digital uh, viewing of their menus because people wanna see what's on their menu before they go. I know my son, when he uh, travels and he always looks at Yelp and all these other websites to see what the reviews are like, he'll also look at what the menus are like. And I, as I mentioned, he's a 32 year old, so he's prime for you know this market and online. Um, and he uses it all the time. I mean, it's not something that I normally would have done myself. Uh, can use uh, credit cards online as well. Uh, and, you know, people are, I, I was asking a client the other day, how one of the people that I'm working with now, you know, how much of their sales are going to be through credit cards and or cash, which is not as common today. And I think he said it would, he thought it was going to be 60, 40. I think it's probably higher use of credit cards than that. Uh, free delivery, certainly restaurants did that as well. And uh, I know, you know, in a certain geographic area, uh, restaurants will only go out a certain geographic area because they otherwise, they have to, you know, it takes a little bit longer and make the reservation online. Some people are also using, you know, things like uh, Door DoorDash and I uh, forget the name of uh, the other one that uh, other delivery services. The, they have a, an issue with them. The, some of the restaurants have an issue with them because they take a fairly big chunk percentage of the sale. Um, and so some places do not want to do that. So they're finding their own other ways to make to do delivery. So digital is going, not going away. It's funny because when I first started in the restaurant business back in the 70s, we were, and when we had the restaurant, which was 1980 to 1979 to 83, a long time ago, obviously, you know, we were still with an old cash register. Uh, credit cards were not as big in use. So they were in use, but mo mostly cash. Certainly didn't do anything with digital because digital didn't really exist. So. I'm still a little bit of an old school kind of gal, but that's, I, if I was in the restaurant business today, I would have to do all these different things as well. So as I mentioned, I was gonna mention, you know, food shows to attend. I happen to like trade shows. I think that they're a really good way for people to learn about the food industry, uh, whichever part of, part of the segment of the industry that they think that they want to get into or you want to get into. Um, I did look up the most current dates for um, the shows for this year so that you would see when they were and where they were. Uh, the fancy food, and most of these now have come back to being in person rather than vi digital uh, or, or you know, virtual. Uh, the fancy food show is at the Javits Center and it's in June. Uh, it's a nice big show with lots of good food and you go running around the show and you taste foods that you may not have tasted before and you learn what's hot and what's not hot. They also do uh, seminars while you're there as well to give uh, uh, people other things of interest, uh, other um, you know, pieces of information that might help them as well. Uh, the Natural Foods Expo is also a fairly large, I've never been, but it's a fairly large uh, important um, trade show to go to. It's in Philadelphia in the fall. Um, and again, if you're looking at doing something that's more healthy, Natural Foods Expo is, is a good place to go. I believe they also do it uh, down in, in, or they have done it in Maryland as well. But this year in 2022, it's in Philadelphia. Since I work with a lot of different uh, food producers, uh, food manufacturers, as I like to call them, I found a Food Processing Suppliers Association that has an expo, it will be in Chicago in the, in the fall, uh, where you would learn all about what kinds of things do you actually need to make a product uh, and manufacture a product. Uh, and, and I would th think that that might be very helpful for, for those of you that are looking at doing any food production. Um, there is also a national, that's coming up relatively soon in May, National Sweets and Snacks Expo. It's in Indianapolis. Uh, I've never been to that either, but it might be, if you're looking at doing sweets and or snacks, it might be good to take a trip out to Indianapolis to see what it's all about. 
um, again, it's gone back to being in person. IDDBA is the Baking Association. It's always in Atlanta. It's in June. Again, I've not been, but uh, well, I think I, I went to one show that was in New Jersey, but that was a bunch of years ago. Um, and again, all about baking and what's going on in the baking world. The International Restaurant Show happens to be in New York. It, it, I, we just missed out on that one for this year. Uh, I put the 23 dates down because that's next year, but we just, because it, it's usually in March and we're just, we're already in April. So I, but I put March dates. It's another huge show. I believe it's at the Javits Center um, that highlights restaurants as well as other food service operations. Um, and also, I think if, if I'm not mistaken, because I have been to that show, they do work on hospitality and what's going on in, in rooming and things like that. The National Restaurant Show is another big show. It's in May. That's always in Chicago. Uh, unfortunately, I've not gotten there, but it, it might be interesting to go. Uh, and then because people are interested in healthy food, I also looked up the uh, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics that's in uh, Florida in October. So those are some of the food shows that you might like to attend if you are just at the beginning stages of thinking about going into the business uh, to learn more about it, to start to meet people, to figure out what, what's hot and what's not hot, and what you might want to do with your own place. A lot of vendors are there. So vendors are representing of, of food products as well as equipment. Usually manufacturers are also there as well. So you get to see what kinds of pieces of equipment you might need or want to buy. Um, it, they're fascinating shows. Plus, of course, because most of them are food shows, you get to eat and drink often. So that's kind of like background about the food industry. And, and these are just the some of the basic steps that I always like to talk about for any business that, getting started. Um, the, and I don't know if in some of the other um, previous events, whether or not uh, they went through this, but I'll, it, it's not a bad idea to go and repeat, um, I don't think. Uh, so we need, the first thing you have to do getting business in business is think about what kind of legal form of organization you want to choose. That could be a, an LLC, an S, sole proprietorship, whatever. Uh, generally for most foodies, I, I tend to lean towards an LLC or an S corp, uh, but I, I try to steer away my clients from sole proprietors and partnerships, primarily because of the risk involved in food. Um, and, and you might wanna think about that if you're thinking about getting started. I usually suggest that you talk with an accountant first, possibly an attorney, but an accountant to figure out because it's based on how you wanna report your taxes. Um, as a SBDC counselor, I'm not allowed to give specific advice in that regard. Uh, SBA is our primary uh, funding source and they don't want us to do that. Plus I'm also not an accountant and an attorney, but I do suggest that you talk to them. We have a referral list that I can send out if you happen to need a referral list for an accountant or attorney or an insurance agent for that matter as well. Uh, if you do the LLCS route that goes through, you can start with New York Business Express. It's an online site that leads you through all the different things that you need to do, it will lead you to the direct uh, location, the direct division, of corporations that you need to register your business with. You need to do a name search, uh, which is right there on the, on the website. It's a fairly easy process. I have worked with clients directly, helping them through step by step when they're uncomfortable about doing it themselves. I recommend that you, if you need help with it, certainly <coughs> get a hold of me or and somebody else in my office to help because people who spend $700 with LegalZoom, now they may be worth their money, uh, don't need to spend $700 with LegalZoom because we can help them through the process. Sole proprietorship or partnership is done at the county level. Uh, you register with the county. It's not done through the state. Again, I, I tend to have my foodies steer away from those two legal forms. Next step is to go to the IRS to get an EIN number. Even if you're not going to have employees, you still call an employee identification number. You don't have to pay for it. I've had clients come and say they paid for it because when they looked online, they went to a website that 
we came up first before the IRS and I recommend that it should be for free and goes directly to the IRS website. We happen to have a document that I send out to all of my startup clients. Uh, I call it my startup package that describes this as well as what the different legal forms of organization are. And if you would like that, I can also send that out. If, if you provide your email to me, I can certainly do that. Uh, you get your EIN number and then you go and you open up a bus separate business checking account from your personal account. It helps do your taxes when it comes tax time that you separating out your personal finances from your business finances makes it a whole lot easier to do taxes. Set up a bookkeeping system, get an insurance policy, um, and then depending on what you are doing and food is one of those items that some food items are sales taxable in New York State, some items are not. I also have a document that describes that as well. Uh, if you do need to collect sales tax, you go to this uh, New York State Sales Tax and Finance. It doesn't cost you anything to register. One caveat with that that you have to remember is that it's, uh, it's done originally uh, uh, when you first get started on a quarterly basis. And if you have no sales taxable uh, income, you still have to report it and you report a zero and, the, and sales tax and finance is fine with that. Uh, you just have to remember to report on time. And if you don't report on time, you get a $50 fine. So I always try to remember to tell my clients to pay attention to the calendar because they don't send out a notification that it's due. Uh, so you need to be able to figure that out. So that's the business basic steps that you need to take to get started in just about any business. And then um, permits and licensing, and I, you know, it's certainly something that you would need to do to be in the food business. Um, the New York State Business Express website would help you as well do that. Uh, and depending on the kind of business that you have in the food industry, it could be through the County Board of Health if you have a mobile cart food truck. And I work with a lot of, of people that are looking to do that, that are not restaurateurs that want to have a food truck. Um, one of the caveats about having a food truck or a mobile cart is that you need to have a commissary kitchen, a, a, a licensed kitchen to do all of your prep and storage of your food. Most people who start a, or want to start a food truck didn't realize that when they first got started or were thinking about it. It makes it a little bit more difficult um, because you, you can do some preparation on the truck, but not a lot, and you can't store your food on the truck. So it means that you have to have a, a kitchen to do that in, and then you bring the food to the truck or the mobile cart. And then at the end of the day, you bring it off the truck and that becomes problematic. I, was, I had a food truck client that didn't realize that. He found a, a restaurateur that he knew, uh, this was in New Paltz, and uh, made all his food, went to the store, grocery store, bought his food, brought it to the restaurant, cooked it, brought it to the truck, got it off the truck at the end of the day, brought it back to the restaurant. And he found that very tiring. Um, it, you know, but it is what it, it, it is what the requirement is, is to have a licensed kitchen other than what's on the food truck. The Board of Health will license your food truck, but you can't really do a whole lot on it. Um, so it makes it a little more complicated than most people realize. Obviously, they do restaurant licensing um, and, you, you know, they, they'll tell you, uh, I have looked at the Orange County site. It's not as forthcoming as the Ulster County um, site in terms of the information about the licensing. Um, but I'm sure, I, I assume that it's fairly similar to what's going on in Ulster County. Ulster County is my home base um, primarily. And you know, they, they give you a long list of, of requirements and how much it costs. It's not that expensive to get a, a restaurant license. You know, they tell you, you know, all the different components that go into the license. Um, that you need to make sure that you have um, before you can actually open. You can't, you shouldn't be able to open without a restaurant license. Now, for those of you that want to have a restaurant that also wants to sell alcohol, which is where the larger percentage of the, you know, it's a higher, higher profit margin is in liquor, you go to the New York State Liquor Authority and get a liquor license. Uh, it's a long and involved process. I don't know, the liquor license application is probably a good 20 pages or so 
A lot of folks use an expediter to help them because the process is so lengthy and long and they do background checks. Uh, you can't have um, you know, uh, bad marks against you. My stepson at one point was looking to convert a building that he owned into a small cafe that was also gonna have a license. Um, and he was gonna be working with a fellow that he was actually gonna do it because my stepson is a builder. Um, and the guy was going to be the operator, but the, oper the, the, the friend that he was going to use had some legal issues, had been in jail, actually. Um, and he was not going to be allowed to be anywhere near on that license because of his past history uh, in, uh, you know, bad things that he used to do. And um, so you have to, they do a very in-depth background check. So if somebody is involved in the business has that, they will not be able to be on their liquor license or have anything to do with it. So keep that in mind. There's also a beer and wine license also comes through the liquor authority. That's usually a little bit easier to get and a little bit less intense. Uh, and if anybody, needs to get an expediter. I also have a list of expediters. I provide that to my clients as well. Um, because, you know, there are some companies around uh, that do it. Uh, and um, usually it's, it's fairly expensive. It, I've heard anywhere between five and $10,000 to use an expediter. But it certainly can help the process along if you want to uh, use that, go that route. Uh, and some people are, are doing that. The Department of Ag and Markets, New York State Department of Ag and Markets is where that home processor license uh, comes from. I don't know if anybody else read, there was an article in the New York Times this week, which was very interesting to me because they were talking about the home processor license because the home processor license will license a person's home to do production, but it's a very limited license in what you can actually produce. A lot of it is baked goods and not baked goods that have to be refrigerated. I mean, the list is, 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 I have that list if anybody's interested, but the article in the New York Times the other day was about an, an organization, I believe out of New York City, that was, a, that was getting people to make hot food out of their kitchens, even though it's illegal to do that. And they even said it in the article. And I was wondering, were they trying to change that license by promoting the, the idea that people, you know, chefs were using their home kitchens to, to produce hot foods, which is not allowed? Um, I don't know. So maybe that license is up for grabs in, in the future. It was in the New York Times uh, just the other day. If anybody's interested, I have a link to that as well. But the home processor license will be the only license that is available right now if you wanna do any production out of the house. Um, it's very limited and for most people um, and most products, they have to go and find what we like, I call it commissary kitchen. And unfortunately, there are far and few between licensed commissary kitchens in our area. I have at least spoken to the Ulster County Economic Development folks about the possibility of you know them opening something in their interest in helping small business. Uh, I don't know what, I believe uh, the Cornell uh, Center in, in, I don't know if they have one here in, in Orange, but I believe in, in Sullivan County, they have a licensed kitchen that people can rent time. There happens to be one that I know of in, in Dutchess County at the uh, old underwear factory uh, in downtown Poughkeepsie that, license, that is a licensed kitchen that allows people to come in and use their kitchen um, and you know, for time, like, a, like almost like a timeshare. Uh, those people also have to then get a 20C license to be able to use those kitchens. Uh, and that also comes from the Department of Ag and Markets. I happen to have both of those in my, in my resources. If anybody's interested, I can certainly share them with them. Um, I don't think, neither one of them, the 20C license is very expensive. It's a little bit less expensive, certainly than a, re a full restaurant license, but it, it, it is necessary. The other thing is if you wanted to open up a specialty food store or a store that, where I live, there's a small store that recently reopened about a year ago. It had been open, it had been closed for a long time and two women took it over and they opened up a small grocery slash prepared food store and that license is a 20C license from the Department of Ag and Markets. They can only have, I think, four seats within the operation. They also sell grocery items uh, and um, 
but that, that's where that license comes from. It comes from the Department of Ag and Markets. And it's not as difficult as I understand uh, to get uh, as uh, would be from the health department. And then, you know, the, the, some state, some local villages, towns and county might be requiring people to have a surf safe certification that's through the National Restaurant Association um, so that people are serving their food properly, uh, storing it properly. And that's what that surf safe certification is. I believe that the culinary still was offering that as a class to outsiders because they also have a, not only do they have their, um, you know, degree programs, they also did, uh, you know, adult ed. I don't know if they're still doing that or not, but I believe that they do. But it, you can get it through the NRA uh, as well. So the National Restaurant Association. And so food service specific, some of what I was just talking about is not, uh, but if you are going to do a food production manufacturing, you need to have your food tested. And the place to get the food tested is the Northeast Center for Food Entrepreneurs. It's through Cornell University. Uh, it's up, I think, in Schoharie County. It's not out in, in Cornell and Ithaca. Um, and they do the testing for food producers. I've been working with, any, like I said, I've been working with any number of folks that are food manufacturers. Um, they send their food product up to the Northeast Center. They test it. Obviously, they charge for that. They also have other resources as well. Uh, talk a little bit about labeling because when you make a food manufactured product, you ha obviously have to label it and label it properly. They also talk about that as well at the Northeast Center, um, as well as packaging. Um, they talk about what's called hazard HACCP which is the hazard analysis and critical control points. And they also help people get through that process because as a food manufacturer, you need to be able to identify where are those points in that manufacturing process that could be the potential problem area. And so that's what that HACCP is all about. Um, my students at the culinary on the associate side would take a class in uh, food safety and they learned all about, I took it myself when I first got to the, cause I didn't, I hadn't learned about it. I took that class myself to learn more about it. Um, and it's quite scientific and learning about the different critical control points where something could go wrong. Certain things, ha certain foods have to be at a certain temperature. And that's what that uh, is all about. And you learn about that because uh, we need to make sure that our food system is safe. And that's really where that comes from. The Northeast Center also has a listing of co-packers. Co-packers are people that are, are food producers. So let's say you made the, the people with the, the granola. They didn't want to actually, if they didn't want to package it themselves, there's a listing of co-packers that are around the country uh, that would take your product and package it for you uh, and then give it back to you or possibly even actually you know ship it out to whoever your customers are we did have and i'm not i'm not sure if he's still if they're still around and we did have a very large co-packer in kingston who only wanted to deal with people who had a lot of sales they weren't going and looking for newbies uh new people starting um so they weren't available but the Northeast Center for Food Entrepreneurs has a listing of co-packers around the state and I believe around the country that can help people that don't want to actually do the food production themselves. One of the things that you have to make sure is that then they don't steal your recipe. So you have an agreement with them so that it becomes still your recipe and not their recipe. Um, and it can work for a lot of different people because they don't either that um, I've been working with people that think that they want to have their own food production facility, but it can be expensive to create and they have to, you know, meet certain standards. They can't necessarily use, uh, you know, a, a home kitchen, as I mentioned, they have to have a commercially licensed kitchen to be able to do that. And in some regard, it can be expensive to build a home, you know, a commercial kitchen. So a co-packer could be another option for some people that are looking at uh, doing food production. And lastly, in terms of food specific, one of the items that one of my colleagues recommended that I at least talk about 
um, is cost of goods sold because cost of goods sold is how much does it cost you to make your product? And so you usually do it by recipe. It's recipe driven. And you, and you take all the little items that make up a soup, for example, you know, the carrots, the onions, the celery, whatever it might be, you, you buy it in bulk, but then you have to break it down by how much is actually in that specific recipe. And then you can figure out how much your cost of goods sold is. So when you look at a financial template that shows you what your sales are, what comes right off from your sales is cost of goods, at least in, an, in this industry. And for restaurateurs, the, the um, traditional theory behind it is, is that food costs are around 30% of sales. Um, so you knock that 30% off immediately. And if you go higher, then you, you know, you, you, your uh, profitability might go down, obviously. I was brought in by a, a, a restaurant group that had a destination restaurant doing over a million dollars in sales. Not that. Uh, this is pre-COVID. And they were losing money. You know, and so I did an analysis of their financials. They gave me their financials. I did an analysis of their financials. And one of the first things I found was that their cost of goods sold was considerably higher than that industry standard of 30%. It was closer to 35. Um, another industry standard for food uh, is about 30% for labor. Their labor costs were around 35 or higher uh, heavily uh, on the management side. And then the rest of their expenses were probably pretty much in line. Usually what we say is 30%. So 30% for food, 30% for labor, and 30% for everything else gives you the possibility of having a 10% profit. Industry standards for restaurants say that rest restaurateurs will operate between a 2 and 10% profit margin. So if they were losing money, they were losing money because they weren't paying attention to their cost of goods first, and they weren't paying attention to their labor costs. And I told that to them in a meeting with the chef, the general manager, and a bunch of other people that were there. And you know what they said to me? We're going to cut out our marketing. And I went, why? Your food costs are too high. Your labor costs are too high. Why cut out marketing when you're a destination place? How do people find you if they don't look? at some sort of marketing uh, promotions that you do. You need to pay attention to your food costs because that's a, you, the food people have two things that they can control, food and labor. And if they don't do that, then they're gonna lose money. And this company, this restaurant group was losing money and guess what? They closed, that's what happens. Uh, so food costs, I do happen to have a sheet if anybody's interested, I could certainly send that to you after we're done, if you, if you, you know, are, are interested in seeing a, a, a template. I didn't want to bring it up during the, 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 this webinar. So some other basics, we know that we have to pay federal income tax also for our employees. So we have to make sure that we capture that. I recommend that you at least, and today it's probably a lot easier than when I was in business, uh, you know, mechanically only because you have computers and you take care of all that stuff and a lot of the, the uh, on, you know, the, the bookkeeping systems will do that. They'll keep track of it. We had to do everything with paper and pencil. Um, and, we, and we set aside our money every week to, in a bank, a separate bank account to pay our employee taxes so that at the end of the quarter when it was due, we had the money to pay it. We didn't have to take it out of operations. It's a good idea to get in the habit of doing that, I think, so that when it comes time to make the payments on a quarterly basis, you have the money and you're not coming from that week's or that day's you know, income. So it's a good idea to just set it aside and because it's not your money. Um, and the federal government and the state government with both income tax and sales tax are not necessarily very accommodating to you, to the businesses when they don't pay it. They charge penalties and interests, which could kill you. So make sure that you capture that information. You also have to have employee insurance. I'm talking with a woman who has a, a small food business, mostly uh, prepared foods, uh, delivers it out. Um, she's in Orange County and she was talking about expanding and possibly doing mobile unit and things like that. 
And, you know, we talked a little bit about insur uh, employees and she said, well, she's going to probably hire her children. And I said, well, even if you hire your children, you should also be taking care of their employment insurance. Uh, even if they are your children and you provide them roof over their head and things like that, you want to make sure that they are covered uh, for insurance and you have an unemployment insurance, workman's comp and disability. And I was talking with somebody um, who has a business that's not a food business. And I was saying that at least in terms of workman's compensation and disability, depending on the kind of business that you have, you're, there's a rate that's charged. So I found out at some point or another that Baker's compensation, workman's compensation disability rate was higher than a restaurant employee. And the reason for that was explained to me was that many bakers work in large facilities with big equipment and they're more likely to maybe get hurt. So their rate was higher than a restaurateur, you know, a cook in a restaurant. Uh, this guy is doing something with saws and sawmills and things like that. I would assume that his workman's compensation rate is going to be fairly high because of the risk to the uh, employees. But he has to pay it and take care of it. Um, and if he doesn't, then he could lead himself into some hot water uh, for sure. We don't, and I, I don't know about anybody else, but I try to make sure that I, I, I tell people that, you know, you have a certain set of requirements as a business owner that you need to pay attention to. And certainly taking care of your employees is a, is a big one. Now, I also taught human resource management for a while at the culinary when I first was there. And one of the first questions I would ask, we were talking about all this stuff. Um, how many of you have ever worked off the books was a question I would ask. Everybody, including myself, raised their hand because we worked in the restaurant business. We worked off the books or some of us worked off the books for some of it. And I said, you know that that's not legal. And of course they all laughed and shook their heads and all this stuff. And I said, here's the problem without, with you wanted the cash in your pocket. And the, and the owner didn't want to pay their taxes on you and pay all this stuff. But if they ever get caught, either through the Department of Labor or the IRS, guess who's responsible? The owner of the business, but also you as the employee who accepted payment in cash without paying your taxes. And whenever there's a, a problem, then it's not only is it the payment of back, in, back taxes, but it's also penalties and interest. So you want to make sure that you as a business owner do everything that you can to stay above and beyond legal. So I, I want to, well, I don't even know what time it is. Let's see, what time is it? It is 7.05. I, I left enough time, hopefully, for questions. If you have questions. There's plenty of questions. This is me. That's my, as I mentioned, the best way to be in touch with me is through email, morrisj at sunyelster.edu. I'd be happy to send people any information that I have that's related to what we talked about tonight. Uh, I have a large package of information that I can send out, but uh, since I don't have your email addresses, if you just email me and say I was at the, you know, the webinar for boot camp, I'd be happy to send it out. It won't go out tomorrow. I'm actually off tomorrow. I'm celebrating my, I have an aunt that will be a hundred years old on Saturday and I have a big celebration. Uh, hopefully a big celebration where she lives. And um, so it'll go out next week. So questions, please ask me because I can stop sharing my screen. Any questions? We actually have a few. Okay. And okay. Elizabeth asks, do you need a license even if you just want to start business by selling food to our coworkers? Le legitimately, yes. I mean, I work with people who do things under the table to begin with, um, and I try to get them to go legal. The problem with going legal in the food business is the licensing. You, you, home processor license is very limited in terms of its um, what you can make. Do people do this all the time illegally? I'm afraid to say yes. But should, should you do it that way? No. As, and and with, with that article in the New York Times, one of the things when I shared it with all of my colleagues around the state through our listserv, well, some of them said, wait, the first person who gets salmonella, food poisoning, 
<laughs> you'll see that this will it will go down, you know, because it's not allowed. But it, I, I, I was I was actually very much in shock when I saw that article in the New York Times with pictures of people who are doing it. But no, it's not legal. But the, okay. People, then Ms. Gentastic asked, are you allowed to have liquor truck where you can serve drinks? How would that work? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I have had people who wanted to do that. I believe if I'm not mistaken that you need to get, so it would, if it's not inside, like with the liquor license, they wanna know what the place looks like, where you're gonna store your product and, and things like that. They actually ask for diagrams of the, of the interior of the where the bar is and all that stuff. So if you're gonna sell it out of a truck, I think they might have a mobile license or a temporary license. They're not assuming that you're gonna do this all the time. So like caterers, when they go and they, they go, let's say to an outdoor event and they wanna sell alcohol, they get a one day license. And I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but you know, and, and things with the COVID, one of the things that they allowed to happen was that people were allowed to sell alcohol to go. Um, you know, yes. but whether or not they're going to continue to allow that to happen, I don't know. I mean, I, it seems to be that nowadays they actually are talking about keeping that ability for a lot of bars and restaurants. However, with in this case, she has she's talking about a liquor truck. Does that have to be licensed? Does she have to be stationary? I would imagine that she'd have to be licensed of some kind. I don't know yes. what the, I don't, I would assume it would be from uh, the liquor authority. I, I, I've never been asked that question uh, as a permanent structure, only alcohol or alcohol in food. Um, because in some regards, the alcohol license also does require you to serve food. Yes, to absorb the alcohol. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I don't know the answer to the question. I would have to do some research. I, I truly don't know the answer to the question, but my guess is it obviously has to be licensed. And then I have a question from Miss Elizabeth. She said, do you have to be in the food business to attend fancy food shows? No. I said, no, right? I didn't think so. No. I mean, I've actually been to them and I, and I, I just like to eat. <laughs> <laughs> that's what i said you know you get to eat it's it's yes. fun you get, you to, get to taste so many different wonderful cultures every it's just amazing it is amazing no you don't need to be in the food business at all no do you need a license to sell in a farmer's market yes well for, first of all you need to be you for a farmer's market you need to also have the sales tax because I believe most food items are sales taxable. Not everything is, as I said. Um, sales tax is one of those er those gray areas that drives me nuts because when you look at their their form, and if you ask me to send it to you, I can do that. It, it says certain foods are sales taxable, and then they give you another another link to another site that says if that one is or not. They just don't give you the whole list. But generally, you would need to be licensed to sell. Certainly the, 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 um, the vendor that runs the, the farmer's markets are asking people for their license, you know, their, their sales tax, because they have to, you actually have to show it. And to produce food, you need to have a license. Aww. Then they ask, can I please have a copy of the food cost template? Sure, just send, like I said, anybody that wants any of the documents that I have, um, or wants to ask me a question offline, just send me an email with your email address, specifically what are you looking for, and I'd be more than happy to send it to you. Yes. Also, where can I buy wholesale food packaging materials? Well, mm -hmm. one of my, it's funny, one of my, I, I was asking a, uh, one of my former students because he, he was a, sh a chef, but then he has a company now that he, he's in Massachusetts, he's making fancy popcorn, flavored popcorn. So I happened to ask him and he gave me a list of uh, and places to go for packaging. And I, I have that as well, if somebody's interested in it, um, because you know it, di different kinds of food need different kinds of packaging. Uh, sometimes it can come through a paper goods store. 
I mean, we used to have one in Kingston, which is closed now, Spiegel Brothers, that had packaging that you could buy stuff from. But uh, I think a lot of it now has moved to online. And I, I certainly, I have some information about it in my files if somebody's interested. Yes, I'm sure they are. Let me see. I am also interested in available templates and information mentioned to receive. Thank you. I already put Ms. Jean's email address in the chat so you all can actually have it. Okay. If you didn't already take a screenshot of her last screen. Okay. okay. And happy birthday to your mom or your auntie. No, my my auntie. auntie. My your auntie. auntie. Yes. Yeah. Happy birthday to her from Mrs. Fevrier. Well, thank you very much. It, it's a surprise that she she's outlived everybody. And it's a surprise to her and to the rest of the family that she's still around. <laughs> But she is. She lived alone till she was 98. God bless her. I, I know. Fantastic. She's, she's pretty awesome. She's pretty, <laughs> she's pretty awesome. She's so sweet. Okay. Um, um, I don't know who Future's name is, but I was going to change it for her, but I didn't get her name. So I can't change the name. But anyway, you can now unmute yourselves. If you have questions, please feel free to ask. There's no reason why you can't just straight up ask a question. It's okay. It's nicer to have conversations like that. It's like when we're in person. I really miss that. I have to tell you. Is it anyone? So until they figure out what they want to ask you, I wanted you to let them know all about the research facility in Albany that you all have and how amazing that is. Oh, you mean through our SB... Uh the, the research network? Yes. Yeah. You have one of the most amazing places where people can get all this amazing information. Mm -hmm. Yep. I use them all the time. I'm a big user. We have, for those, for the participants, we have, we're, my, our center in Mid Hudson, which is located in Kingston, covers Orange, Dutchess, Ulster, Sullivan County, parts of Green, Schoharie, and Delaware County. Um, we have a central administration office up in Albany, and part of that Albany office is a group of people, as you mentioned, called the Research Network. And when I don't know something, and i be the first to admit that I don't know everything, um, even though I'm an old bag, but I, I don't know everything, um, I reach out to our Research Network and they find information out for us, for me, for my clients. Um, and it's a fabulous service that we can offer free to our clients. Um, and they do all sorts of research about things that, you know, we can't know. I always tell my clients, I think of myself as a good Google user, as probably most everybody does, but they are trained librarians and they have access to a number of different uh, databases that you and I can't get through Google. And plus then they, because they are trained librarians, they are very, very, very helpful to my clients. So like today I was talking to a young woman who sells crystals and she was looking at, we've been working on her business plan together. And one of the things that she was asking was that she couldn't find any kind of market data about how crystals are selling and what crystals are selling and who are they selling to. So I told her that I would reach out to our research network and ask them that question. And I can guarantee you that in a week or so when I get the information, it's gonna answer all of those questions for her, relatively easy for no cost. So yes, you, thank you for mentioning them. They are a very good resource for us. So like the question about the liquor um, mobile truck, if I don't know the answer and somebody, I could reach out to my research network and they certainly would do the digging and finding out whether or not it was how, what kind of licensing, my guess is obviously through the liquor department, liquor authority, but they would find out more about it and if it is actually even legal. So yes, th th thank you. They're a very good resource for us. So Yamina asked Hi. if you could, could you please write down the name and address of the company? Thank you. <laughs> what company? I am not sure, but I told a SBA gene would have that information because well, I'm sure you mentioned right something. I think it's the research, right? R research. And they're located in Kingston. No, uh, my office is well. 
I've been working primarily from home since March 12th, 2020. Um, but um, no, we have a, an Albany office that has a group of people called the Research Network. And you, you would get, ask me for the information and I would ask them because somebody has to be one of our clients to be, and it doesn't cost you anything to become one of our clients. Oh, okay, I'll send you an email then, thank okay. you. Yes. Hi, I just have a question. Sure. Uh, how difficult is it to get the home processor license? And what do you mean by it's just limited? It's limited to the, the kind of food that you can produce. Meaning, um, you know, they don't want things that need to be refrigerated, which is, you know, a lot of baked goods can be made, but not specialty cakes, but like things, you know, and I, I, I guess I could find it. I could show it to you. It would be easier if I just sent it so that you would have mm -hmm. it for yourself. Which, which food products are allowed to be made in the home? They, they will come, they will look at your home, they'll make sure that it, you know, it's clean and all that stuff. But it's really about the, pro it's not only about the kitchen, but it's also about the product that you make. And they're worried, and my guess is the reason that they have the home processor licenses, they're worried about you producing food items in the house that might be, cause people to get sick. So for example, right. I, I was working with a woman who had uh, farmed on her property and made kimchi. She was uh, she was Korean, and oh, she, I like kimchi. And she wanted <laughs> and she wanted to produce in her kitchen, but she we talked about it. We talked about the home processor license. What she ended up doing was she wanted to, and she also wanted to teach class in her. So she had a a, a, a tract home here in in Ulster County, and she had a two bay garage underneath the house. So she was gonna create a kitchen in one of the bays of the garage. But she went for the health department license rather than the home, the 20C license because she also wanted to do classes and she wanted it to be broader. So she went for the home, uh, for the license. They wouldn't license her home kitchen. She had to build a whole separate kitchen underneath in the, in the one bay of the garage. She had to have her water tested every year. They had to make sure that the water was clean and appropriate. Um, so they, 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 don't, they don't really make it very easy for people to use people's homes because it's, it's generally considered not safe. Is there a kitchen incubator in Orange County? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I would like, there, there, I had some people that were starting in Orange County because there is an incubator, I believe it's in Newburgh, um, but, uh, and then they moved to Kingston. Uh, there's a center called the Cornell Center for Creative Education. I don't know if you're familiar with Kingston. Oh, yeah, I've it's heard in of the, it. It's in, it's in the Midtown area. They have two sections. One is the food incubator and one is the creative side, the art side. On the food side, you rent what's called a pod uh, for a limited amount of money and you create your kitchen. And what it is, is that you, you're supposed to be staying in it for maybe up to two years. And I think it's like a $200 a month rental, which is nothing in all in the grand, excuse me, in the grand scheme of things, it's nothing. I actually have had a client in there and she's, gra she's graduated to her own location now. And we've had a nice. number of people that have graduated to their own location. Um, so I don't know, I, again, I, I could ask my Orange County folks if they know of a, a food incubator here, but I, I, don't, I personally don't know. Uh, again, I, my, my home base is, is in Kingston um, and I'd have to ask. Yeah, you know, there are a lot of people that actually want to start their own food business, but they need some place where they can just start out, start out small and then grow up to a brick and mortar which is what most people like to do. And it's a lot easier if you go that route, as far as you can't cook in your kitchen, even though most of us do. <laughs> but, <laughs> and I don't sell anything, but I do make a pretty decent cookie. <laughs> so my, my daughter's famous for it, but I, you know, it's not something that most people would do because you don't sell out of your home. Right, well, and then- It's a hobby, we're turning it into a business. 
the, yes, the home processor license also it has some limitations on how you sell. So it's not just the product. And I, that limitation, I don't really remember as well as the, as the product limitation, but I do know that there's some limitations to how you sell and where you sell. Um, again, that's listed in the, in the material that I have on home processors. And you're very right. I get asked all the time because again, I get a lot of foodies because of my background. And you know, when they're divvying up uh, clients, I get a lot of the foodies. And I have to say to them that, you know, there's very far and few between licensed kitchens that you can go to. And, it, and if you want to build one in your own property, I'm working with somebody who might do that. She was, she was originally looking at a, a local church that had just recently uh, built a new kitchen, but it's limited for her for what she wants to do because there's not a lot of storage. And so she's kind of, and they also wanted way too much money for her to, to run, to, to use her kitchen. She was hoping that it was gonna be, you know, more in the couple of hundred dollars a month rather than in the $2,400 a month that the, the church was gonna charge her um, because then it would put her basically out of business. Uh, $2,400 a month rent is a lot. Yeah, that's a bit much. Uh, it's a, well, and also it was only gonna be three days a week. So, I mean, you know, she might as well oh just, it, it, she might as well just, you know, rent a, house. A, a, a whole brick and mortar and do it there exactly. and have it, and not have to share the kitchen. Um, but I know that, you know, in most cases, it is a good way to get started if you can find a commissary kitchen. I also tell people sometimes to check with their local churches because some of them have kitchens that are already licensed to be oh, able to do nice. food production. Um, but it, again, it's far and few between. I actually have a client down in the Ellenville at Warsing area who is thinking of opening up a, a commissary kitchen. I don't know if she's proceeded or not. So she would be able to make her own product and then rent it out to other people uh, to do the same thing. But I don't know if she's gone ahead and done that. I, you know, again, uh, like I, I just want to say one thing for anybody who's planning doing any cooking. We like samples. We'll help you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but when I get there, you know, it's a different story. But yeah. yes, that would be amazing. It would be amazing. We can get a kitchen incubator somewhere in Orange County so that it'll be easier for someone to get started and get a feel for how much they can sell and the volume. That would be just amazing. Yeah, yeah like I said, the one, one woman that I was working with started in Orange County, but then got shifted up to Ulster County to go to the Cornell Center because I don't think that it was meant for kit, you know, food products. I think it would, like, I think I had somebody in that incubator that was also like a clothing manufacturer. Right. I, I believe, yeah, you I can't believe that, and, 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 you know, clothing and food are not. Yeah, you can't have them together the because of the fibers in the air. Yeah, so I, I, I don't really know, but I could certainly find out by talking to my uh, two colleagues that are much more familiar with Orange County than I am. That would be wonderful for anyone asking because I think the idea of the truck, the liquor truck, that's pretty cool. But I think it has to, would have to be a stationary type of thing because you, you know, you, you have to, how do you gauge? You have to get people licensed and make sure that you're not selling to minors who might have fake IDs, stuff like that. That could be dangerous. What do you think, Ellen? I know that was a really, really great question. And it, it'll be interesting to find out how, if it can be done, how it's done. Because you're right, it's not like going, because you keep thinking about it too. Like when you have street fairs or events, how are people doing that? But um, so be it, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how it will be licensed. Okay, let me see if I missed any questions in the chat. Okay. Thanks for joining us. Da, da, da. I sent so many messages out. New license, new food coworkers. You know, my mom used to cook. Well, back when she was around, she would make arroz con gandules and she would make pollo guisado. And a lot of people loved her arroz con pollo. She was like really a good cook. And they would pay her, they would buy her the products and she would put it together for them but she wouldn't charge anybody ever. She just like 
she loved to go. We had come from a big family. I have nine sisters and two brothers. And so <laughs> my mom just cooked a lot anyway. But she would cook for them. So they brought her whatever they needed, they wanted, and she would put it together and they would just be so happy. That was Still amazing. illegal though. <laughs> yeah. Well, she didn't. They bought her the stuff, products, like they bought the beans, they bought the rice, and she would make it. Yeah, she didn't yeah. sell it to them. They yeah, just well, bought it. It's like somebody buys you, you know, cake mix, and then you just make a cake. Certain things are cultural as well, you know. You take then, Hispanics, for example, we tend to feed the whole family in the neighborhood if they come to eat, legal or not. And so there you go. Cultural. And it's that's cultural. exactly what it was. Like, Everything is not just legality. You also have to give room for your neighbor, your friend, you know. I mean, if there's so much legality, why do we have so many people out there that are starving? Well, I well you know, we feed the whole community. With one care. of the things about the article in the New York Times was sort of leading into that, that people needed to eat and need, need to eat so that then they can, you know, they need to eat so then they can, pay you know charge for their food so that they can eat and that was sort of indicated in this article but the you know the bottom line still uh, yeah and it, you know maybe the license is restrictive um but on the <laughs> other hand you know we have to deal with any food funny. safety so i mean it, it, it there's it, it there's two sides to the story i i certainly agree with you because i've i've worked with any number of different businesses over the last bunch of years, you know, and, and yes, we need to be able to provide food to everybody. And I agree with you. Uh, there's a church in Kingston that I, I'm sort of was working a little bit with. They have a kitchen and they were thinking about licensing it out, you know, the, to more than they currently have one tenant in there that serves food to people in need. And now they were thinking about expanding that use to include other food producers to rent the space. Now, whether or not they end up doing it and, and charging a reasonable amount, not not twenty five, you know, not twenty five. Wow, that's just a bit much. Twenty four hundred for well, three yeah. days. Yeah, which you know, my client's not going to take it. She's still going to. She's now. She's going back. Thank you. She's she's look looking at you know maybe creating a kitchen on her property. So she can become legal because she's been doing it illegally for a while, you know. And you leave yourself open if there is a if there is a rule and a law and you're against it, you leave yourself open to getting into. Indiana. Wow, could you imagine? But I just, I just, I'm just fascinated by the fact that people are love to cook. They just love to cook, and sometimes. It's not about selling the food to anyone. It's just about sharing it. Yes. Oh, I, 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 yes, I agree. But on the other hand, if you do try to sell it, then you're creating a business and, the, you oh, yeah. account, and you're not legal. Yeah, mommy never sold anything. You're not legal. My mom also was I, a seamstress, which and she just made us clothes. But she didn't sell any of the clothes she made. Everybody just liked what she did. Mm -hmm. Which my, my sister, my little sister, she used to have this cute little bolero jacket with a pencil skirt. She looked awesome. She could have been a model. <laughs> my grandmother was a seam and grandfather. My grandmother was a seamstress and my grandfather was a tailor. Oh, wow. And when I was little, I got clothes from my grandmother, but you know, then she stopped making clothes. I don't, when I was, you know, probably a teenager. We, so we have a call. <laughs> a comment about someone who was late and can we watch this again? Chris sends the, um, the link, correct? Yes. Send that? Yep. You can go to the library's website. Let me see yep. if he has it here at all. Yep. That's to okay. see all the other. Cause I, I created yeah. the, the slideshow as a PDF file for, for Chris. Oh, you're such a I, ha I have a question. Yes, I'm Elizabeth. Here. Yes, um, so if I go cook in a, a legal, church kitchen mm -hmm. and then sell my food that's that's okay i still need a you license still need, you need a license oh i still you need, need a, a license you need that 20c license to be able to do that oh because i was just thinking like if i'm starting and why will i you know get a license if i'm i just wanted to try out if people will like my cooking um well because that's what the law says yeah um, 
it, it, you know, and it, like I said, I've worked with lots of folks who do things that are not legal. And eventually um, I try to convince them that to become legal is a good thing because you, otherwise you can lead yourself sure to that trouble. And um, is it my job to, to, to get you to, to become legal? Mm -hmm. Yes. But again, and, and the, the 20C license is not an expensive license to get. Mm, okay. Thank and you, you will so. protect yourself by getting licensed because if somebody gets sick, they can sue you because right. they got botulism or, you know, maybe just disagreed with them and they got a little sick, but then it's all your fault. Yeah, we, so. we live in a, in a very, uh, what's the word, litigious environment yes, people like to so very true. and food is one of those areas where you are that's why i try to convince any of my clients to stay away from the sole proprietorship and or a partnership and go with the llc or an s corp only because they provide a whole lot more legal protection because there's a barrier between you the person and the business if it's an if it's a sole proprietorship or a partnership there is no barrier between you and the business and they can come directly at you and i mean not that they can't sue you anyway if you're an llc or an s but you do have a bit more legal protection which is why i also always tell people to go and get a liability insurance package that protects you in case somebody does get sick so that you know you, you're and he said thank you for all thank the useful you. information she said i will look into the kitchens at the poughkeepsie Underwear factory? Yes. It, well, <laughs> that it, is it, so no, funny. It wasn't it's so, not an underwear factory anymore, but they do have on the first floor <laughs> a, a kitchen. I'm and sorry. It just was when she wrote that I was like, an underwear factory. I thought she was trying to be fun. <laughs> no, but thank you, Annie. You made me laugh. It's it's on uh, the main drag. Oh, nice. On, on the main drag. I can't remember the the, the actual street. Viviana the, wants to know about how much is it? How much is what? I don't remember how much it costs. Oh, I don't think I don't it was very, was. it wasn't as expensive as the church. Cause what I did for the church that I was working with in Kingston was I got some stats from our, our research network about what are other people charging? $25 an hour, if you're going to use a whole day or three days adds up to a lot of money over a course of a month. And there is another place in Kingston called Seasoned, which is on uh, 209 as you, in Lake Katrine, heading out from the Rhinecliff Bridge. And their interest is that they primarily are focused on um, people of color, women, and indigenous. So they have a, a, an interest because they also have a nonprofit that works with you know, BIPOC, and they have an interest in providing space and i don't really remember how much they charge but they're not nearly as expensive as this church was i just want to make a little comment because um it's a little confusing we have three iphones on only one says future which i know that's the person's name but the other two you can't get credit if they don't know who you really are so you can actually just go over your on the click on your name or on your iphone and change your name. You can just right click on with right next to the microphone, the black microphone or the unmuted, the muted phone mic and, and change, rename it, put your name there. That would be easier. And, and also. one other thing that I, I, I was asked to remind people, uh, attendees, there is a survey that I guess is posted somewhere um, that they would like to make sure that you actually fill out um, about tonight's event. You know, yes. good, bad, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, and I, I, I was asked to remind people about it. And Chris will also send that out with the link to all of the today's presentation. Viviana de Leon. Hi, Viviana. Thank you. And that would be absolutely amazing. I'm going to put her name. That is in. helpful for I'm us. I'm changing too. her name. Yep. <laughs> and it's helpful for us with comments because then we can. Uh, identify what type of uh, workshops to have in the future as well. And um, if people would like to, to see basic workshops or with the food uh, service business, if there's a topic that's even more 
uh, details if you would like to learn more information about. So it just, it's very helpful for us. Viviana, I hope it's okay. Can you see your name? You can unmute, uh, don't mute, just unmute so you can say hello. We don't have to type everything, people. Come on. Come on. Uh, don't be afraid. Do we have any more questions? Elmona. It's funny because my husband said, so are you going to ask people because of the time of day that this is 6 to 7.30, did people eat dinner? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, I did not. <laughs> I have a question, um, but <clears throat> would you all have in the future any kind of setup for home-based businesses like to start something from your home? I think that is the I, 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 you, you have to, you guys have to answer that it question. That you will be I mean, I, I deal with home-based businesses all the time myself at, at SBDC. Right. That's what I would like to start something from home. Yes, and do you know that a lot of a lot of big businesses started at home in their garages, in their in their living rooms, in a little quiet spot in the house. That's the best way to do it. Like I said, my background happens to be in food, so I get a lot of foodies, but I also deal with all sorts of other businesses, startup businesses, existing businesses. It doesn't really matter. The Small Business Development Center, funded by SBA primarily, as well as the community college, our host institution, and our hosts in, a, in the other counties. We're free and uh, we work with any kind of business. I, I just happen to be a foodie, so I get, I get to deal with a lot of foodies. Awesome, awesome. So what do I do? Do I just like send you an email and set up like an appointment with you? Yes. Okay, all right. Very well. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Demtarises. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, Mrs. Fevrier, please go ahead. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, thank you. I, my question is, say if you wanted to like start like a networking business in a sense, and then you kind of like, you want to host a lot of like restaurant things. Do you have to get a license for that or it's just up to the I'm individual? I'm not sure what you, what are you, what are you gonna, what were you thinking of doing? Like, you know how they do like these food festivals, like the beer festivals and chicken festivals. Do you have to necessarily get food handling license to host that, host those businesses or is it the business's responsibility well, to I, do so? I think you need some sort of license to be the host. Now, whether or not, if you don't actually have a kitchen there yourself, if like, let's say, I, I mean, I go to the, you know, um, the Sheep and Wool Festival, which is up in Dutchess County at the Dutchess County Fairgrounds. And there's all sorts of food vendors there. I mean, the, the host institution, the host of the, the, the festival has to have some sort of license, whether or not it's a food license or not, but they have to have some sort of license to be able to host the event and then the food vendors have to have their own license to be able to do that because they're generally mobile, you know, in, in, in trucks and things like that or in carts. Uh, but yeah, I don't believe unless you actually have a kitchen that you would need to be licensed, but I, that I don't know. That would, again, would have to be something I'd have to research. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. You're very welcome. Also, I wanted to say, um, Viviana said, I would love to start a small food truck. Mushi was not sure how to start it. And well, one of the, she came late and she was a little perplexed because she didn't want to miss everything. She needs to be licensed through the Board of Health um, and, and then have a place, a commissary kitchen to do the food storage and food production. You bring the but food. first you need to go to with make an appointment with the SBDC so they can guide you on that whole the whole trek and it's not going to cost you anything to That's get this right. counseling. That's why they're there. That's why Lady Jean is here to help you. Right. Yeah. She is awesome. We don't Let me tell we, you. Don't, we don't charge. No. Easy. Your tax dollars at work. Uh, and I have one more question. Yeah. Who is Newberg? You've been at just about every one of our e workshops, but we don't know who you are. And we can't get you credit or get a certificate to Newburgh because that's, that's the name of the city, I think, right? Do we know who you are? Do you have any? We're at again. 
Yes, hi, it's me, it's Marilyn. Marilyn? Yes. Marilyn, what is your whole name so I could change it? Marilyn Scott. Marilyn, M-A-R-Y-L-I-N or? M-A-R-L-Y-N. Marlin Scott. Yes, Marlin, yeah. Okay, uh, I just changed it. There you are. Thank you, because I had a problem trying to, because I couldn't get in. So I figured, you know, I had to. No, that is just fine. The way to change it is when you go, when you put the cursor over the, the picture, unless you're on the phone, um, mm -hmm. you'll see the microphone if it's muted. And then you just right click on it and you scroll down to where it says rename and put your name in. Real simple. Or you can just send me a chat and say, could you please put my name there? I don't know what's going on. Oh, thank it's you. So much. More than happy. Thank you. You're very welcome, love. Thank you. Okay. See, that was quick and easy. Now I got everybody's name. I know who you are, I think. Do so I have I to change it every time? I mean, like if no, if Every you time. when you first come in, if you can't, if you put the cursor over your name, oh, you can't see what I'm doing. But if you put your cursor over your name and you don't see your name, mm -hmm. then you, all you have to do is right click by the phone by the microphone. Oh, okay, okay, I get it. When it's oh, when it's off, you'll be able to see it. I can right click on your name now and rename it. But just in case, for anyone who's interested, who because we would really need you to do this so that we know who's here. This okay. way you get credit for it and you get that certificate. I think it's a certificate they're getting at the end of the boot camp or something. So you get actual credit for doing this and everybody and some people who are in SEEP, they'll be able to get the credit for real because they need it. And that makes it so What, what is the credit for once you have it? If you're able to use this credit going forward to work. well you can prove that you actually took a training oh, to help okay. you get started in business okay a so lot of I times like when you start a business people want to know how you know how honored did you were you able to i have also one start out from at least i have a foundation yes you do i'm sorry i'm just i'm reading and talking at the same time i'm just terrible see this I'd is like one to of the reasons thank for everybody business. for their attention. And if you have questions, please shoot me an email. I'd be happy to answer them. And next, Cindy Vaquero next, said, thank you so much. <laughs> she said, thank you so much for this information. I also wanted to start, and at least I have a foundation. I am now going to get more information and reach out soon. Have fun at the party and good luck, everyone. Thank, thank what you. A sweet thank you. I'll be reaching thank out to you, you as well. Thank you. Thank again. you. Bye -bye. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you, Jean. You did a lovely job. Thank you. Be well and stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Thanks. I thought we were here till eight o'clock. That's why I kept talking. I don't know. It's just me. Okay, my children, till the next one. When's the next one? The 24th? The 24th, you said? No, no, no. I'm oh, trying to remember fifth. when. I think it's the 5th. The fifth okay. or every other week. May fifth. Oh, I, I believe it's May fifth. And it's always okay. the same password, right? To get in, because I had a that that's why I got it late. I was like, oh, I can't find the password again. That's okay. okay. Newberg oh. lowercase. Okay, no problem. <laughs> now I know. That's Thank you, Amelia. Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome, love. Bye, everybody. Good day. Bye, -bye. Have a great one. Yep. You too. See you. <laughs> Bye.